But actually, that at least as a first step, it held a mirror to everybody, for everyone to understand that we're all part. So while we all want to be part of the solution, we are all part of the problem too. We've mm. all played a part somehow in the problem. It's okay to say, okay, so these are the things that I don't do. And these are the things that I do do that are part of the problem. And choose then, give people the chance to choose to be part of the solution. You know, yeah. help those people that are also barriers understand yeah. what they're doing because they might not be conscious of it. And you know, there may be some people that aren't conscious of it and that's a different conversation. But the people that are not conscious of it, help them understand what they can do. Hello and welcome to Voices with Talking Talent, the podcast that explores the real issues people face in the workplace. This is a space to have the open and brave conversations that inspire change and spark action. We're Talking Talent, and every week we'll be joined by a different guest. Stay tuned for discussions on the issues that business leaders are trying to overcome and what the future looks like for truly diverse and inclusive organizations. Hi, I'm Rebecca Hurston, and I'm the host of today's podcast episode. I'm also a managing director at Talking Talent, heading up our women's leadership programs and service line offering. And for the past 18 years or so, I've been an executive coach specializing in women's leadership. So this is a huge passion of mine. Um, and today I'm very excited to be joined by KK Harris and Shamala Kailasam, who are both super experienced coaches, leading DEI experts. And I'm very pleased and proud to call them my colleagues here at Talking Talent. We're going to be talking about driving difference today, how we can ensure that women in all their diversity uh, can achieve their potential. We're going to be talking about and exploring some of the barriers faced by different women and taking an intersectional approach, talking about even what does that mean, this, this word intersectionality, um, and truly what that means for within our businesses and within our teams. And all by looking at how we can together uh, take steps to close the intersectional gender equity gap. So here we are, uh, three different women ourselves, I think it's true yeah. to say. Uh, KK, let's start with you. Tell us a little bit about you. Yeah, so um, as you said, I'm, I'm one of the executive coach directors here at Talking Talent. I have a real strong passion around diversity, equity, and inclusion, and often do talk for podcasts. I've been asked to do podcasts and things like that, just primarily because I'm also very interested. So I take one of those views of speaking about what I've learned. And um, I'm also uh, on the way to completing a business coach psychology, psychology master's, uh, which it, my uh, thesis, dissertation, whatever you want to call it, is really looking at the lived experience of, of a black coach and what that's like in the room and what we're bringing into the room and how we can better understand each other in that, in, as coaches uh, mm -hmm. that show up to support our clients. Yeah, great. Thank you. And I think it's that lived experience that would be great to hear some of your insights on today, uh, both mm -hmm. your own lived experience and your lived experience coaching. I know many hundreds of, of women across the years. Shamala, let me come to you. Um, so I'm Shamala Kailasam, and I came to coaching through a journey of working in the corporate world as a management consultant for many, many, many years. And my journey started with coaching just because I had a passion for getting people to to drive forward and and to reach their potential and it soon became a passion around particular types of people they were the people that were underrepresented and I realized that I was diving into through my coaching practice into the world of diversity equity and inclusion and my passion just grew and grew and grew and then I became a mother which was quite a recent thing and I'm a, I'm a mother to children with a mixed heritage so their um, their father is white English and uh, my my heritage is quite long convoluted and they are both girls and uh, one of them has also got a disability so she's also deaf so then that then really solidified this passion for me mm. you know how can mm. i how can i be part of the solution to create a world where they can both live up to whatever potentials they have and get yeah. the same opportunities as anyone else particularly my daughter with the disabilities so um so yeah so that's why i'm here and i'm really excited to be here yeah and i love how you say about you know being part of the solution because I think that's the thing, isn't it? We will no doubt air some of the problems and challenges today, but it's also really about 
how can we move forward to, to, to some solutions around this, even if they're not so easy? Yeah, it's so important, isn't it? <laughs> it is. So um, I, I thought we'd start with, you know, th this, this word, intersectionality. Mm. You know, well, what the heck is that? What's <laughs> it all about? Right, right. Hey, Kay, um, well, what, what's your experience here? You know, it, it's an interesting one because I think in this space, the DEI space, this, you know, inclusive coaching that we all practice, that we're part of, the programs we're part of, it's coming up, that word intersectionality. And it is kind of like, well, what is this? What are we intersecting? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. where are we intersecting? You know, and so that would be, say, if we're saying a Black woman's experience of intersectionality may be, say for me, I'll speak for myself, I'm a Black woman. So here we go. Well, what else intersects with my gender as a mm -hmm. Black woman? As a, So we got the gender and it's a Black woman. Well, what intersects? Oh, I'm also neurodiverse. So mm -hmm. ADHD. And then what else intersects with that? I'm also an LG, a part of the LGBTQ plus community. So there's so much going mm -hmm. on. But if we said she's a woman, what yes. else is intersecting with that? She's yeah. a black woman, gender, again, what else is intersecting with that? And so it does confuse people, but I also think it's it's something that helps us realize that, you know, we are all kind of coming together, almost like we really got to recognize there's a lot that we are the same. Very mm -hmm. important um, conversation right now. Yeah, and I, I love that. And here we are, you know, we, all three of us happen to share a sameness of all being female. And yet, I think this 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 point about intersectionality is at the very heart of it. Is just because we have a common experience of of being female, that you know, our, our other intersections actually may cause us to experience the workplace in a really really different way, um, which we'll come on to, to, to talk about. Shamala, what, what about for you? This this intersectionality. Yeah, it's it's a really interesting word, and it's a really interesting concept. So for me, it comes to me particularly when we talk about choice. So if I'm choosing my identity and who I and who I want to show up as at work, mm. do I choose to show up as a British born woman? Do I choose to show up as a British born brown woman of South Indian stroke Mauritian heritage? Does that come into my identity? Because that's also another intersection. Do I identify with that heritage? Do I identify with being a mother? So a parent as well as being a woman? and a working woman do identify being with somebody that used to run their own business so an entrepreneur as well as a you know as well as a woman and and somebody who is not white or is brown and do i identify with being a parent of a disabled child it's a really important question to ask everybody because we all have different things that intersect our identities mm -hmm. And if we're able to become aware of those, we will find different commonalities, as KK was saying, with different groups of people. I'm very aware that I have a lot in common with other parents of disabled children who may not be female, who may not be white, who, sorry, who may not be brown, who might be white, who might not be British born, who might be from a different culture altogether. And that brings me together with them. And they are then able to explore the different parts of me that perhaps they don't have in common with me and I'm able to explore the different parts of them that, that I don't have in common with them. So it's a, it's a really lovely tool to use to become more connected with other people. I love, I love this thought, you know, intersectionality as commonality and as connection points. And that, of course, by definition, not all the points are points of connection and sameness. I mean, we're talking here today about driving difference. Yeah. So it's about it's about, I guess, welcoming where the differences are, but thinking about intersectionality also as where almost gateways to where we do overlap with mm -hmm. each other. I mean, it's interesting because, you know, as you, you're both talking, you're talking about your experiences, your, your, your backgrounds. You know, I'm sitting here really honestly, I'm sitting here as a straight, white, able bodied, neurotypical female myself. Mm -hmm. Oxbridge educated to boot you know I've got privilege coming out my ears and I'm wondering about this you know because we talk about you know different women's experiences I wonder what, what can someone like me do to better understand and maybe to better act on 
the barriers that may be being faced by by other women, by, by women who have different backgrounds and different experiences? I'll, I'll jump in there, Rebecca. I think what it is, is that be willing to ask the questions, mm. right, of others. It's like, okay, so Shamalis just said she's a mother, so you both have that in common, right? I'm a mom too, but you, 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 you too. So you do have some commonality mm. right there, you know? And so she has a, a, a disabled child, you don't, but you have the commonality. Be willing to learn and understand the other. That's mm. so important. You know, as coaches, we're trained to ask questions and to ask the next question and the next question and then pose questions, right? So we're already, we're taught that. And I think there's something quite powerful about that. And I think, you know, it is a challenging time for all of us in society as this society becomes more equal, you know? So we mustn't forget that say that the, what is deemed as the dominant group or the, are you a white, white person from that, the dominant group or whatever, also may be struggling, right? Mm. Maybe struggling mm. to be understood, to maybe struggling to to understand, you know. And I think there's something to be said about you know um, being open, just being open. You be open mm. the best you can because if your group is this homogenized group, you step out of that group and and get to know me get to know Shamala I know you are but uh, you know just as someone speaking in the, listening in the audience be be curious because most of us in this professional world we do work in in uh, with diverse people so yeah. get to know be curious be curious. and Shamala yeah I love that Shamala I wonder if you can um you know what, what advice would you have to to, to managers or perhaps the and I practitioners and professionals who might be listening to this you know how how can we be curious in a way that doesn't offend i think if you're if you're authentic about your curiosity mm. it comes across mm. if you're genuinely interested in the answers you're not just doing it as a tick box exercise which mm. we are you know we're all familiar with with since uh, for the last few years essentially uh, many many organizations have started to tick box yes. and actually we're on a press precipice now where I think people are beginning to get that that doesn't work mm. the tick boxing doesn't work and what really works is to look at each other as human beings and to really connect as KK was saying this this thing that we all have in common this curiosity can be a real tool mm -hmm. and an authentic curiosity is lovely there's nothing like somebody being interested in you and wanting to know more about who you are and what you you know what you want for your life and what you want for your family's lives you know having somebody taking the time to understand that is really quite lovely yeah. so if you are a manager being curious in a way that is absolutely genuine if you really want to know how to help the people that work for you how for them what what does their potential look like for them what does reaching their highest vision look like for them and then asking them about the barriers and that's the question that I think is the most important one. You know, where have the barriers been in the past? What barriers do you see now? And how can I help you as your manager to get over those barriers? What can I do? And that's the that's the importance. But first of all, get to know the person, you know, asking yes. barrier questions when you don't really know who they are or what they want in their lives is a little bit intrusive. The first part is that connection. It's got to be the connection. Yeah, I would say I would say on that barrier question, I would say I would I would argue the point that you know as that manager, say say how have I been a barrier? Oh, that's a lovely so, question, right? Right? How have I been without, a barrier? without self shaming, without critiquing myself? Right. Because curious question, yeah. curiosity. Yeah. How have I been a barrier? You know, when KK's been on this team for quite a while, I've noticed so and so and so and so and so and so they've moved up. How have I been a barrier? How when and when is their performance review? What am I said? What am I? What's going on with me? Let me yes. look, let me look inside here because most companies are on a mission to to drive that that diverse change. You know that to be more inclusive, to create equity. And so if you're in that position, it is you know what have I done? And now what can I do? Because there you 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 came back on that Shamala. It's like, you know, wait a minute, it might be intrusive and sometime it might be putting the blame on that person. Like, so what can we do? No, what what have you done? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> what have you not done? 
know? yeah we can so easily go to they can't we talk about well what do they need to do yeah yeah and, and it's a yeah. rather it's a rather special position to be able to sit back and go oh so that i i've noticed now that i don't invite kk to the meetings when on you know on a regular basis but i do invite mm. joe Mm -hmm. right. And, you know, and the reason I invite Joe is just Joe and I get each other so well and we just don't even need to talk about it. We just go dive in and we get the work done. Right. So it's it's just examining what's really going on on a daily work to, working day practice. What yeah. can you start to try that's different? Have mm -hmm. you tried having a conversation with somebody that you've you've never spoken to other than work have you tried asking why they can't make they can't make meetings after a certain time you know have you know mm -hmm. what is it what is it about them that might make you feel a bit uncomfortable look inside first before you go and ask them you know it does does something that they say or do make you feel a bit uncomfortable okay what is that about me that i am uncomfortable when that person talks about a particular subject there's a lot of looking inside mm. i mean there's a real maturity of leadership here actually isn't there to, to 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 have the guts to look inside and to say right well what, what am i doing here and what's my piece in this jigsaw i love what you're saying there and we've started talking about about barriers and you know that, that i mean so much data out there on the barriers still facing women and nuances of that for some of the intersectionalities we've just been talking about, of course. So the barriers facing women are not just the barriers facing women, full stop. There are the intersectional considerations of if you are a female plus whatever other layer in your identity might be combining to, to, to make there be an even greater barrier. I mean, I know the World Economic Forum has recently found that we're still over a century away you know 108 years away from closing the economic gender gap i mean that's well they're wrong well okay so why are they wrong <laughs> i hope they're wrong KK. Yeah, but, I, you know it was 108 years to closing the gender gap did you say or ethnicity yeah the, the yeah <laughs> the, the gender gap globally the gender the economic gender gap the pay gap if you like so that's a global okay they're saying globally okay yes. I, I i can i can believe that but i don't want it to be true and but i'm also speaking from that western lens right because we've we've come so far if, it, if we were just looking at the west and say no way if we're, we've come so far do we have a way to go yes you know but and now i'm not trying to like toot our own horn but what we do at talking talent right we are we have women in leadership which you are that the lead on you know women in leadership programs that create that equity right which and we have these wonderful dialogues in there with managers yeah, and, yeah. and 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 uh, sponsors and participants so i like to say that we are helping to definitely to close that, that timeline the chop, like the chop into the 108 years hey yeah well yeah. you know it, it it does sound daunting right but mm. i mean kk and i both facilitated these dialogues and those dialogues are a space where people who are not in the intersections who are not women so men who are maybe of a certain age and who are white and who have had it really good for a long time are able to explore that and ask these difficult questions and listen yeah. to the answers and hear the experience and i don't know about kk but i know that i've seen them the aha moments that come to them that yeah. and that that really you know i remember watching a colleague of ours host one and um one of the male participants put his hand on his heart and got quite emotional that and had that questioning that kk mentioned the oh what have i done where have i been the barrier and he mm. suddenly realized he'd been the barrier for many women's careers wow. and it really got him and mm. he was then he then committed to keeping that feeling that knowledge and then working on okay what what else can i do how else can right. i show up what else can right. can happen and it, that power of that questioning and the power of what we do is phenomenal and i think it like kk is saying it is really chipping away at that 108 years yeah. um, because it, you know, we, who else are, who else for us is going to really make a difference here? We all have a place to, a part of this, really. We all have a place in this and we all have a part to play in this. Yes, yeah, so I, I get that. Sorry, like you go for video. 
like that video inclusion starts with i yeah. indeed absolutely what were you saying back sorry yeah yeah well i mean actually just to endorse what you just said there about that i i just think that is that sums it up so beautifully doesn't it inclusion starts with i and you've just shared that anecdote there shamala about that particular manager and and it it strikes me and it goes to well organizationally so what can you know what what can organizations we've been talking about barriers right what else can organizations do and the individuals that make up organizations what, what can we do to dismantle some of these barriers that are still out there well i think i think the first thing is to become aware of them so uh, there's nothing like data to be mm -hmm. able to shed light on um, what's really going on in the organization so first look at the data look at the stats look at um who's where in the organization look at who, you know who's got potential and where they're at um so get a baseline of where you're at with the data and then start looking at the practices um how do you recruit and i know many organizations have worked worked a lot on recruitment um, yeah. and they have tried lots of different things, but really reflect on what's working and what's not working. So spend right. some time looking at that first stage. And then once you get people in that are more diverse and that have got this, this plethora of talent, I mean, the thing is, and we haven't mentioned it yet, but the diversity brings extra and more interesting talent different talent and different talent will spark different talent from the people that are already in the organization because we just, you know, creativity always begets creativity and talent always begets talent. So, so be aware that these people are coming in at the beginning of their journey in your organization. And then how do you foster and create a pathway for them to continue to develop? So as you look at their career path, so if you've got somebody in, so like, if we go back to the, the example that KK mentioned, so KK is in the organization for an amount of time, how far has she progressed in that time? Because she came in as a bright young thing with all of this potential. So it can't be that it's that she's changed because she hasn't changed that much right, in that time. Right. So what has been in her way and look at those case studies mm. and have a look at what barriers because the barriers might be different depending on the organization. They might be process. Go on. Yeah, well, and I was interesting to loop back to our earlier discussion around intersectionalities. And I wonder what both of your experience, both personally and in your coaching experience of others, you know, what barriers do you have you noticed still particularly exist for women of color? for women in the LGBT community, for women with disabilities, and so on and so on. I'm going to keep it real. Mm. <laughs> people block people, right? People's bad behaviors block people from moving up. Mm. We need to identify those people within the business. And you identify those people within the business by when you're putting your strategy together, you're assessing what is going on in that business if you really want to create change because we all have heard it we can all get at on a low level when they're first coming in you're getting diverse talent you're getting black men and women coming into the business maybe lgbtq maybe some disabled maybe etc 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 as we're moving up the we're starting to see that pipeline thin out our diverse talent is leaving mm -hmm. this is factual it's leaving you need to ask why yeah yeah you and indeed to just, just, just to kind of bring in a stat there you know the, the the mckinsey latest women in the workplace report the 2021 version excellent report you know what what they're showing is then their latest data is that whilst you know whilst 17 percent of entry-level positions go to women of color mm -hmm. by the way 30 percent of entry-level positions go to white women Mm. By the time you get to the C-suite, the latest data is only 4%, 4 percent women yeah. of color. So that reduction yeah. from, I mean, already a small amount at 17 percent at entry level, but, yeah. but crashing down still. You just lost 13 percent of, of your of your uh, your black talent. You just lost 13 percent of people who could be doing a fantastic job, who could be helping Absolutely. you earn more money in your organization. Right. These are people blocking people. We have to, you know, people want to say, let's not do unconscious bias training anymore. We know unconscious bias training. Yeah, we, but what happens is we then, a lot of companies, they don't take it from there. Now we'll start, we have to look at, now that we are aware, aware of this, where can we, can, can we turn the dial here? Can we create mentorships 
mentorships programs. Now, and understand this, if 17% black women coming into the business, 30%, you're already outnumbered, right? Mm. Now let's, let's, let's take us back to our youth, <laughs> our younger years, right? Remember how uncomfortable we were going out mm -hmm. into the world, right? You're less likely to speak up. Maybe you're the first in, in your family in, in the professional space. We're just talking about professional space right now. You don't, maybe you've never heard about mentorship. Maybe you've never heard of advocacy and sponsorship, whereas your white counterpart graduated, maybe like to, to you, you back, she Uxbridge educated, you know what I mean? You, you know, maybe there's professional fam, maybe your mother or father or somebody in the family is professional. you got a leg up. Oh yeah. A leg up. She does not have a leg up. So it is up to that manager's responsibility, or even as you're coming into their graduate schemes, or you just joined, you need to be running through, understanding about mentorship, about advocacy. That needs to be part of your induction. So mentorship, advocacy, such important things that you're, you're speaking to. Shamala, I wonder what else, you know, what else can organizations be doing differently? And, and you know, KK, I, I loved your point there, you know, people block people. Mm. And if that is true, then we surely have to look at the hopeful opposite of that, which is that people enable people. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I think, I think that's a really important point. And I think both points can be backed up with data. So if you look at your organization, you can see the, or the parts of the organization where people flourish, particularly people of different diverse backgrounds are flourishing and doing really well. And they're, it's not just that they're brilliant and sure their brilliance will have a part of it, but you can then find those managers that are helping them, that are, are giving them those tips, that are finding them, helping them find the mentors. You know, I was on, um, back to the work that we do, I was on a dialogue where um, one of the senior women was saying to me that she was, she suddenly realized that all of her mentees were men. Mm. And she'd thought that was fine. And then she remembered that when she was a younger woman in the same organization, she didn't feel that she could go and ask someone senior to be a mentor. Mm. She didn't feel like she could do it, that she was good enough to go and do it. So she wrote down as one of her things that she was going to take away from the session was to go find somebody who hadn't asked, who was of high potential to mentor. Yeah. So that's part of it. So that's finding those individual individuals that understand that they need to go off and help people. Yeah. And then also looking at the opposite, you know, who is blocking people? And I'm not saying naming or shaming them, but go in and understand what's going on for them and help them have a mirror. So this point that KK made around, around unconscious bias training, and it's got a difficult, a bad name for itself now, but mm. actually that at least as a first step, it held a mirror to everybody, for everyone to understand that we're all part. So while we all want to be part of the solution, we are all part of the problem too. Mm. We've all played a part somehow in the problem. It's okay to say, okay so these are the things that i don't do and these are the things that i do do that are part of the problem and choose then give people the chance to choose to be part of the solution you know yeah. help those people that are also barriers understand yeah. what they're doing because they might not be conscious of it and you know there may be some people that aren't conscious of it and that's a different conversation but the people that are not conscious of it help them understand what they can do like this this particular male participant in this dialogue he realized he was the barrier he got what he needed to do next he really got it and he was prepared to go off and commit to it i, I love these practical solutions that you're bringing in as well in what can be a very like it's very easy to talk about all the problems and all the challenges mm -hmm. And most of us working in this space have heard about this for, you know, repeatedly in many different ways for many, many different years. And I love that you're talking about, you know, look for the pockets of brilliance, mm. catch it where in the spots in your organization, people are doing it right. How can you cascade that so that other parts of the organization can benefit from that? Um, and I love if there story. aren't pockets of brilliance in your organization, Bex, there are yeah. organizations where there are. Where there are. So be yeah. prepared and brave enough to go and look elsewhere. And maybe some of those women that are leaving, go look where they're leaving. Where are they going? Yes. You know, 17 to 3, did you say 3%? 17 down to 3%. 4%. 4%. 4%. Yeah. So that's, that's a, that's a big enough percentage. They're going somewhere. To investigate. Yeah, yeah. Where are they going? 
Let, yeah. let me also also add before we move on to the next question. I also wanted to add mentorship is important, but I can't remember the studies that I've read recently. It could have been uh, our very own Donna Hertzman kind of talking about. So we have that mentorship piece. Now that is really important. However, the 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 real change happens in the sponsorship. Yes. And Bex, I think yes. actually it was you. We were talking about sponsorship. So that's where the yes. real change. That's saying, you know what? I know Bex is great at this. It's pushing her forward into something, giving her the opportunity for sponsorship. And then of course that advocacy piece too. Yes. So, so this piece, it all angles. Yeah, this piece around women. I know that Herminia Abara, formerly of London Business School, she's done lots of research around this, of course. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, looking at um women having a propensity to be under over mentored. I don't know if that's possible to be over yeah, yeah, yeah. Such, but and to be over mentored, but at the detriment of sponsorship. So to be yeah, unsponsored. Yeah. So yeah. I think this, you know, this I, I love linking those two thoughts of what Shamala said as well. You know, find the people who haven't come forward mm -hmm. as well and be really eyes open for that. And um, yeah. we've all got the keen beans around us who are putting yeah. their hands up for everything. But mm -hmm. sometimes, yeah. especially coming back to what we talked about today, where there is intersectionality at play. And maybe some quite deep-seated stuff that means that person might not be naturally putting themselves forward mm. um, it feels like there's a real opportunity there for people to enable people oh, i'm going to give a real so, life example just one on quick that. last thing yeah and then very I'm, last then thing so I, I have a coachee who was one who is a woman of a different heritage brought up with quite a strict cultural background who was brilliant came into a company and stagnated and she had a very difficult managers for a number of years for a lot of many many years who did not see her as of any talent or high potential and then one day she got a new manager who sat her down and asked her what her vision for her career was and she says that it shifted her world she didn't think she was had a right to have a vision Right. It shifted her world and she started and she's now on one of our programs on a journey to really understanding where she could go. And she's now thought of as talent, thanks to that manager, who was a white male, who wanted to find out about her because she was very quiet in all of the meetings. She mm -hmm. had brilliant, you know, her quality of work was brilliant, but she never volunteered for anything. And he was curious enough to sit her down, have a mm -hmm. cup of tea with her and ask her those questions. And mm -hmm. now she's just climbing and doing really, really well. So it doesn't have to be complicated. And I think that's such a perfect note for us to end this really rich discussion on. Right. It doesn't have to be complicated. You know, we can go to, oh, there are all the complicated measures. There's very complex data. There are things that are really hard to do. Um, and, I, and I hope that, you know, this, this as we conclude today's episode, you know, you, you've both given us some wonderful and really actionable ideas on and challenge as well, I think, on how we, we can all, each one of us, yeah. drive difference you know really enable to this lovely point you know people enable people um, yeah. what a great way to conclude today's episode thank you so much kk and Shamala. It's so fun it's been so thank exciting <laughs> great conversation bex thanks so much thank take you care all. guys thank you thank you for listening this podcast has been brought to you by talking talent we're a coaching organization that helps you develop advance and retain your talent Together, we can create a more inclusive culture where your people and your organization can thrive. You can visit us online at talking-talent.com. That's talking-talent.com. If you liked what you heard today, please be sure to subscribe and leave a review. Thank you.